Okay, welcome to the next session in the HOT UF 2020 conference. Uh, our, uh, before I introduce the speaker, I'll remind you that uh, we are uh, limiting questions during the talk to just important questions uh, so that the speakers don't run out of time. And that the talk will go for 45 to 50 minutes uh, with five to 10 minutes for questions afterwards. And the chat is open, so feel free to use the chat for, for any side questions you have. Um, and with that said, I'll just introduce the next speaker, Liran Cohen, who will be telling us about building effectful realizability models uniformly. Thanks, Dan. Um, so, and hi, virtual hi to everyone. Um, um, happy to be here. Uh, thanks, the organ thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, and yes, I'd like to tell you a little bit today about um, an easy way in which we can uh, build realizability model uh, that somewhat go beyond the scope of what we're probably familiar with. Uh, and uh, this is a work in progress with uh, Ross Tate and Sophia Farrow. So um, any comments are most welcome. And uh, I probably start with a kind of a disclaimer uh, that um, I am not at all an expert on homotopy type theory. And uh, in fact, the, the work that I'm gonna be talking about takes a somewhat opposite approach to that of homotopy type theory because it really focuses on uh, computations. Uh, but having said that, I'd still uh, like to tell you about these uh, extended models and, and kind of start a discussion on uh, their usefulness, perhaps even in the setting of homotopy type theory. So, um, Realizability models uh, originated uh, by Kleene's uh, interpretation of intuitionistic number theory back in the 40s. And ever since, they've become this uh, underlying foundations uh, of, of what we know perhaps as constructivism. And, um, and, and the, the idea behind realizability is a very uh, simple one, is the fact that we can somehow extract computable content from proofs. So we think of realizers as some code representing some program in some uh, low level language. And uh, we think of a proposition being true uh, if and only if it has a realizer, right? So that's kind of the core idea. And uh, realizability models are extremely useful uh, as the base um, for extensional type theories. Um, and I don't know where they stand on the uh, annoying scale that we saw yesterday in Carla's talk, but uh, extensional type theories are in, particular de uh, in particularly defined uh, in terms of kind of the behavior of the computation. And, and so the, the computation system that the realizability models defined or it captures is of particular importance. Now, despite the fact that uh, these constructive foundations and these realizability model are widely used and extremely uh, valuable in, in various applications, um, the current status or the current picture that kind of is the common understanding of realizability models um, is, is restricted in some senses. And um, this is uh, mainly the topic that I would like to discuss today. So what we'll do today is discuss realizability models and ask ourselves some questions about them. So the first will be to kind of understand what's uh, the state of the art. And when I say the state of the art, I don't mean um, all works on realizability models, because there are a lot of works on different realizability models. But what I'm, ta what I'm uh, referring to is kind of the common understanding of what realizability, realizability models we're usually referring to. And then we'll ask ourselves, um, perhaps, uh, if something is missing from this picture, 
and and um, and and why? Why should we care, right? To to maybe uh, extend this uh, or broaden this picture. Um, and then I'd like to tell you about uh, some examples of ways in which we can actually extend the, these uh, realizability models to capture uh, new forms of effectful computations and uh, not just uh, how to do it, but also kind of explore interesting implications uh, such extensions uh, have on the resulting theory. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, kind of a, a natural, very convenient tool um, for building those extended realizability models uh, in a uniform way and also um, reasoning about them uh, collectively. Okay, so that's kind of the plan of uh, the talk today. Yeah, okay, so let's start with kind of recalling some history or perhaps the current state of things. Um, so the models uh, we're interested in are specifically uh, models of constructive extensional type theories that kind of approach also uh, um, current standards theory, right? And that puts us in the realm of topos theory, which is a, a, a very well-known model that is kind of in between type theory and set theory. And it also exhibits some um, key components that we are interested in. In, in particular, it, it gives us an impredicative type of proposition that's essential if we want to construct a set theory that, have, that has a power set constructor. Right, so, um, so we're gonna focus on, uh, uh, specifically on, top, on topos theory and, and models that are models of both type theory and set theory. Now, luckily, uh, we have a uniform way or kind of an established technique, the tripos to topos construction, that lets us construct toposes from um, triposes or, um, if you'd like, uh, more generally from higher order of vibration. Um, so um, the, this method is very helpful when um, trying to construct toposes because uh, a tripos is a very, very uh, simple structure. Um, for example, uh, it, does not, it, it models a very simple type theory, but through this tripos to topos construction, we necessarily get a topos that models uh, uh, dependent type theory, and in the same in the same sense, the tripos does not necessarily have um, to model, uh, per se, uh, extensionality of entailment. Uh, but this construction, the tripos to topos construction, enforces that the topos will necessarily will, right? Uh, so we can uh, uh, only focus on models on on triposes. And, and this construction automatically gives us all um, kind of uh, the, the more complex constructions um, um, for free, right? So uh, the, the key idea behind this construction is of course to take the, uh, the, the elements of the topos will be the partial equivalence relations or, or partial equivalence relations of elements in the tripos and uh, amorphism will just be a relation in the underlying tripos uh, that has to respect those equivalence relations and to be, um, well, to be total and deterministic. And um, since two morphisms are equal if their um, relations are equivalent in the tripos, that effectively kind of bakes in uh, extensionality of entailments for the topos. And in fact, um, most uh, realizability models of extensional imperative dependent type fees are instances of this construction, right? Including um, right, the well-known uh, effective topos, right? So in, in, in focusing on realizability topos, we kind of uh, reduce the problem to look into realizability triposes and in turn, those are constructed 
uh, from what is known as a partial combinatorial algebra, right? So there is a standard process that takes a partial combinatorial algebra, a PCA, and constructs a realizability topos. And uh, a partial combinatorial algebra is a very, very simple structure. It satisfies a set of codes and a partial binary uh, application operator um, that kind of um, uh, specifies uh, the result of applying some function code to an argument code, um, if, if one such exists, because it's a partial uh, operator. And this uh, operator has to satisfy what's known as the functional completeness property, basically saying that there is a way to encode each expression as individual uh, code uh, through application, right? So uh, it's, it's basically telling us that, that we have enough in there. Um, and uh, well, some of you are maybe more familiar with the functional completeness property uh, as it's equivalent to uh, having the S and K combinator satisfy uh, certain uh, equalities, uh, but it's a bit less direct. So, so we take this definition here. And, and from a PCA, the standard construction that uh, yields a realizability tripos is, is essentially uh, to model the predicates as indexed subsets of codes, right? So a predicate on some set specifies for each element in that set, uh, which codes realize that this predicate holds for that element, okay? And then uh, we define entailment between two, uh, two predicates. If uh, there is a uniform code, and this is key, right? There has to be a uniform code that for any index can convert a realizer of the input predicate to a realizer of the output predicate, okay? This is kind of the common intuition of constructive theories, right? That we have a uniform way to convert one uh, property to another. Okay. So, uh, these are the standard constructions of realizability toposes uh, um, based on, on PCAs, on partial combinatorial algebras. And we now, I, I'd like to ask or, or kind of um, specify some, some properties that we are missing because of these common constructions. So we should note um, that because these realizability models are constructed from a PCA, they, the only effect that they support, that they fully support is non-termination, right? Because the fact that the application operator is, is partial. But uh, non-termination non is just one of many effects, right, in practical software that we can uh, possibly would like to um, either verify, to me mechanically verify, or, or to utilize in some senses, right? But PCAs only offer non-termination. Moreover, um, they um, kind of bake into the construction the fact that all computations are uh, deterministic, right? Because our uh, application operator only results, only returns either no code or one, right? Uh, and, and this is uh, perhaps even the more disturbing thing because it kind of precludes non-deterministic computations. Uh, and of course, those are, um, very, uh, very much uh, um, present in, in, in modern uh, programs. And um, it seems like this deterministic restriction is kind of an historical artifact, right? Because uh, PCAs were uh, made to uh, model the lambda calculus, but unnecessarily they impose this art artificial uh, constraint. And um, so, so the question is, why not uh, explore a way to incorporate other effects into the underlying computation system, right? And um, so let me try to answer the question, 
why we should, right? And not why not. Um, so first of all, um, right, when we're talking about mechanical verification uh, in proof of systems, let's say, that are based on uh, type theories, uh, there are mainly two high level approaches, right? The, the, the first one, the perhaps more common one, is to reason about software externally. Uh, so we describe uh, some abstract model and then we guarantee some properties of that model uh, from the outside. And there's a lot of work done on, on this type, on, on this approach, um, uh, validating very, very complex um, uh, systems. Uh, but there is another approach that tries to both develop and reason about the software internally, kind of taking advantage of the fact that extensional type theories um, are, are, have, have this um, built-in understanding of computation through the proofs as programs paradigm. But um, to be able to do that internally, uh, we can only use, uh, I mean, this strategy um, can only be used to verify software that's built entirely of the computational model that system understands, right? So if we do not have internal support for effects, um, for example, non-deterministic computation, then we will not be able to internally uh, reason about these types of, of, of programs. So we will not be able, for example, to reason about any sort of parallelism, concurrency, probability, exceptions, states, and many other constructs uh, that are essential in uh, modern software. Um, another reason why uh, we should care I guess to extend this, uh, uh, um, to extend the the internal support for effects, is that um, well, non-deterministic behavior is is um, um, is everywhere nowadays in 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 systems and in programs, uh, and and uh, by kind of imposing this uh, restriction that er that all computation are fully deterministic, we're missing uh, our proofs cannot really extend to support that. Um, and another perhaps uh, more um, foundational uh, reason is to kind of make explicit this dependency, right? Because just simply studying other types of models that are based on different notion of computation uh, would put forward the, the kind of rather implicit dependency on the underlying computation system. And uh, another reason that we're gonna come back to is that um, new effects can actually um, enrich the computational theory in a way that can be exploited to provide a computational meaning and implement um, some well-known foundational principles and as well as to find others, right? So uh, there is a kind of an option here to broaden our theories. Um, due to uh, broadening the, com the underlying computational theory. Um, yeah, and if you weren't convinced by my re reasons, uh, so, uh, this is taken from Andre Bauer's uh, lecture notes from 2005, uh, where he writes, um, a comprehensive account of computable mathematics should encompass a rich spectrum of models of computability. We know that they are there, and we know that they do not all give the same computable mathematics, but we know less on how they relate to each other. By focusing on just a couple of models in the name of simplicity and historical importance of Turing machine, an opportunity for, a view, for the view of a larger picture is missed. Okay. So uh, we'll try uh, uh, to answer this call, I guess. Uh, in the rest uh, of of, um, of the things that I will be presenting. So 
here are uh, some examples of, of how can we do that and, and what are the impacts of, of actually considering not just PCA-based realizability models. So before we um, uh, get into that, uh, I'll, I'll just like um, to, to demonstrate the implications of, of uh, considering new um, computational theories. Uh, I'd like to focus in this talk on the axiom of countable choice. So um, the axiom of countable choice is a fundamental principle saying that from any total relation on the natural numbers, we can extract a function. Right? Now, this um, axiom or this principle is extremely important in constructive theories because it unifies the different representation of the real numbers. So, um, 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 so um, we can actually, in system that actually invokes some sort of uh, formalization of the reals, we can switch from one formalization to another only in the presence of countable choice. Now, if we look at the formalization of countable choice and uh, with the kind of realizability models in mind, we get that if we have a realizer for the totality of the relation, then that realizer itself, since it's computable, is um, is the, the, gives us the function that we need to construct, um, which is um, kind of supporting the common understanding that countable choice just kind of holds in constructive uh, systems. But if we take a closer look at this, uh, this proof, we, we, we notice that um, the fact that it holds specifically relies on the fact that the realizer of totality has to be deterministic, right? So um, this is a critical assumption that's not really considered as an assumption because all PCAs are completely deterministic. And so this holds in every realizability model that's constructed from a PCA, okay? So our current picture is that if we go from a PCA into a realizability model, then since the PCA models determine the computation, our model will necessarily uh, satisfy countable choice. Okay. That is kind of a, a well known, I guess. But what happens if we try to extend the computational capabilities? So we wanted to consider a very minimal extension. So we're moving from partial combinatory algebra to relational combinatory algebra. And the only difference in relational combinatory algebras is that our application operator uh, now returns a set of codes. Right? So it can return either zero, one, or many possible uh, outputs. Um, and, and the uh, functional completeness condition is adjusted uh, accordingly, of course. So now we have RCA, which models non-deterministic computation. Um, how does it actually look like? Um, so uh, we have our set of codes. Actually, uh, because we want to discuss countable choice, we also take uh, the natural numbers, so we are essentially working in a W topos, but that's kind of irrelevant to the discussion. And um, there is a, a slight subtlety that we need to address when we move from a PCA to an RCA. Um, because PCAs are deterministic, then if an application results in some code, then it always terminates. But with uh, RCAs, we can have an application that results to a code on one execution, but fail to terminate on another execution. So we have to have two separate uh, relations, one for reduction and one for termination. And these two relations uh, have to satisfy um, the following properties. 
Um, so the progress pro property simply states that um, um, if some application terminates, then there is some code to which it reduces to. And we have the completeness uh, conditions, which are just generalizations of uh, the ones that we had for PCAs, uh, but now considering both uh, termination and reduction. Okay, so here's our definition for an RCA. And now, uh, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, uh, the exact same construction that took us from a PCA to a tripos also takes us, well, not the exact, but uh, a similar construction takes us from an RCA to an RCA tripos, right? So a predicate is still an index set of realizers. And the only thing we needed to change is that when defining entailment, then we require that this code has to terminate on any code uh, satisfying the inputs predicate, realizing the input predicate, sorry. Right, so we only have to add this kind of termination requirement and we get the same construction from a tripos from which we can uh, construct the topos. So, um, so, so non-deterministic computation is not, um, is not changing the constructions and perhaps is a more suitable uh, kind of computational system in which we can explore realizability models. But look what happens. So we can now define a very concrete RCA, which we call the flip RCA. So the flip RCA um, kind of is a very simple one that simply has one additional feature. It has kind of a flip of the coin computation. So we add this primitive flip that when applied to some natural numbers, either compute to zero or to one, right? So that's basically the only form of non-determinism that we add into this system. And um, just for convenience, we add some constructors uh, such as uh, on this vector do, e do p else p prime uh, that kind of says on an input from this um, sequence, act like p else act like p prime. Um, but that's just a matter of convenience. Flip is the really key component here. So what happens if we take this flip RCA and look at the realizability topos that it induces? Right? So what happens is that it's not just that the previous proof of countable choice fails, is that we can now prove the negation of countable choice, right? So adding the, just this slightest form of non-determinism allows us to refute countable choice. And the way we do that, I'll just kind of out outline the proof. Um, we're, suppose we do have a realizer for countable choice for um, the natural numbers. So what do we know about this realizer? Uh, its behavior should be independent of the relation R, and it can only compute on the realizer of the totality of the relation, right? So when we uh, kind of try to compute this realizer on the constant number zero, we know that it has to be based on a finite, um, finite inputs, finite sequence of, of inputs. But, but that means that if we try to apply this uh, uh, realizer that we assume exists on, um, on the uh, code, on the the same finite set of inputs do const zero else do flip this should behave just the same but that would mean that our function here our function f must be non-deterministic on inputs that are not in this sequence which is of course um, a contradiction because f has to be a function right so what we get is that when we switch from a PCA to an RCA, we get models that in which countable choice does not necessarily hold, and in fact, it can be negated. Okay. So now we thought, well, 
okay, what if we add some, some other effect into the mix, okay? And what we did is we further generalized and considered uh, stateful combinatory algebras. So a stateful combinatory algebra is just, um, we add to the uh, structure a pre-ordered set of states, and we index the application uh, operator by those states. So we now have a way to model um, stateful computation. And the way we do it, and uh, I'm omitting many, many technical uh, details here, but the, the, the key aspect here is that um, when applying one code to another, it requires this state that it can then uh, mutate, right? And, um, in addition to the progress property, we also have the preservation property that enforces that even in the system where we have mutable state, we can still maintain certain invariance about um, the state and how it progresses, right? So we say that if applying one code to another in some state results in a code and another state, then this new state has to be um, what we call a possible future of the previous state, okay? Um, and uh, in case uh, kind of possible futures uh, kind of ring a bell for uh, kind of a standard possible world structure like Frick K1 or something of that sort or F1, um, notice that we do not require that uh, reduction or termination, uh, either of those relations are preserved by futures, right? So uh, reduction could reduce to one code in some state, and then in the future state, it can fail to reduce, for example, right? So it's not exactly a standard possible world structure. And an SCA is really a generalization of an RCA because it, RCA is simply an SCA with one single state. Okay, and what we get here, so we ask ourselves, can we still construct a tripos, right, from this SCA? And the answer is yes. And uh, here, the slight modification that we needed to do is when defining the set of predicates, we need to only consider those that are future stable. So here we have to say that uh, phi is a predicate if and only if, right? Um, if I have a code realizing it in some state, then that same code will realize it in any uh, possible future of that state, okay? And uh, yeah, and the entailment relation is just a straightforward generalization. So we get that in the same way or a similar way from an SCA, we can construct a model, a realizability model. But what kind of realizability models can we get, right? So here is one, uh, we call it a MEM SCA. And again, uh, there are a lot of details that uh, I'm not showing. There are a lot of technicality to kind of um, bypass uh, the impredicativity of the, the system when talking about states. Uh, but the key aspects of MEM SCA is that it has uh, these um, two primitives, MEMO and LOOKL, that, allows us, uh, that allow us to uh, basically memoize. And what that means is that the MEMO code, when applied to some other codes, it allocates an input output table at some fresh location L and marks this table with this generator C and then returns uh, lookup L. And what lookup L does when applied to, a, to some number is checks to see if, the, not, if that entry for that number exists in the input output table in, in location L. If it does, it will return us, uh, it, it will return the corresponding output. And if it does not, then it will generate the output using this generator C, right? And again, the, the key point here is that the memoization technique that on the same uh, inputs will always get the same output. 
And what that entails is that, again, in this realizability model, we get that countable choice holds again. Because the realizer for countable choice now is memo. Because when we apply memo to the realizer for the totality of, rela of the relation, what we get is some lookup L, right? And then we need to construct this function, this internal function. But what we should notice is that this function can depend on the current state. And this function can be, uh, it, it, it does not need to be defined in any specific state, right? So we can simply define that S to that F to be the, the input output table uh, for L, which is realized simply by lookup L, right? So this memo and lookup and essentially the, the stateful computation that we're supporting is again allowing us to um, when we're starting from a, an SCA, that model stateful computation, then it allows us to get models in which countable choice. Um, holds again. So, yeah, so these were um, two examples of, of, an, of extensions of the underlying computation theory, uh, computational theory uh, with non-deterministic and uh, computation and with stateful computation. Um, notice that the SCA also allows for non-deterministic computation, right? It, ex it extends an RCA. Um, but the question is, um, can we construct such, ex such extensions um, in a uniform way, right? We don't want to uh, have to reinvent them and, re and, and, and reprove that they give, really do give us a model of higher order logic every time um, over and over. And, and so we asked ourselves, can we kind of extract some uniform structure out of this, out of these general, generalization of a PCA? And uh, what we developed is uh, this notion uh, that we call evidence frame. Uh, and the kind of, um, the, the general idea is that evidence frame would be a minimal structure that will ensures that we can extract uniform realizers from proofs. So we keep with the constructive foundations, but we don't want the evidence frame to impose any constraints on how those realizers actually compute. Right, so we don't want to have any equational theory or 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 things of that sort. So, um, and we don't want to have any requirement on on how the operations on evidence relate to one another and so forth. So it's really a minimal framework that uh, uh, does not limit the computation that can be embedded within. And so. Um, they allow us for a way uh, to explore realizability models without prescribing any particular theory of computation. And, and, and we can also use them to reason about realizability models collectively. So having said that, what are evidence frame? Um, yes, so it might be a little scary. But uh, an evidence frame is essentially just a triple, right? Uh, it kind of abstract the definitions of propositions and evidence and focus solely on what sorts of operation uh, should exist between these components, right? So what we have is uh, a set of proposition, a set of evidence, and uh, an evidence relation between uh, propositions and evidence, okay? Those are the components of an evidence frame. And those components have to satisfy uh, some conditions. And these conditions actually tells us kind of uh, how to link the logical operations and the program operations. 
So for example, reflexivity requires the existence of an evidence code, EID, that satisfies the evidence relation between any proposition and itself, right? So it's basically program identity. Um, and transitivity is kind of program, um, it requires us to have program composition, right? A binary operator that basically does program composition. And, um, and then conjunc conjunction is uh, uh, pairing and pair projections. Right? So we only require the existence of those things, but we don't say how they should uh, behave, right? And, um, and implication is just uh, currying and some closure evaluation. And uh, perhaps the only, the only one without any programmatic counterpart is uh, the universal quantifier. Um, because it just states that um, if you think of it as a frame in the sense of uh, a, a complete heighting algebra in which uh, uh, one uh, evidence is smaller than the other. So um, the universal quantifier simply says that a proposition is less than kind of the intersection if the same code serves as evidence for all the index proposition so it means that that code is not really examining the index. So it acts uniformly without looking into the index of the, the proposition. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the general structure of evidence frame. And interestingly, uh, there is a general construction that takes an evidence frame, even without knowing anything about the computation, and extends it to a model of higher order logic in this uniform way. So our predicate is simply uh, an I index collection of propositions. And an entailment between two proposition is again, uh, the existence of some code that satisfies the evidence relation between these two propositions, okay? So very straightforward generalizations, uh, generalization of the um, constructions we've seen for RCAs and SCAs. So now we know that uh, we can take an evidence frame, a very abstract structure, and still get um, a realizability model, right? In, with, given this uh, uniform construction of a tripos and then the tripos to topos construction. And, uh, but we, despite the fact that it's abstract, or maybe because it's so abstract, um, we, it's very easy to see that it captures, so that PCAs, RCAs, SCAs are all really just instances of, of evidence frames. And what's more, uh, we've, we've shown, we've only managed to test uh, some, but uh, we've already shown that uh, even computations uh, with continuation like the call CC um, can form an evidence frame. So we even get kind of the known computational models of classical logic. Um, and we've also shown that uh, we can uh, embed a, a restricted notion of probability uh, saying that an evidence almost surely satisfies the evidence relation uh, into an evidence frame. And um, yeah, and we, we're currently kind of testing to see what other kinds of effects uh, we can incorporate to the evidence frame framework uh, and, and how natural is the embedding, of course. Uh, yeah, okay. so. I would like to end the talk with uh, a few questions um, that we're thinking about that uh, if, if you would like to think about. Um, so we've seen that uh, countable is can be uh, given new compute computational interpretation uh, when we add stateful computation. And uh, um, so we consider, um, these extended computational um, systems 
as giving us new types of realizability models that might actually uh, allow us to infer some interesting uh, principles, um, maybe some old ones, uh, but also maybe some uh, new ones that uh, might be um, made possible due to certain effects. Um, the other question is, um, can we establish uh, some notion of monotonicity with respect to effectful computation, right? So we saw that countable choice goes from being true to being false to being true again, right, in these extensions. But now that we have this kind of uh, uniform framework of evidence frame, could we um, uh, establish some, some criteria to whether um, um, some, some uh, proposition will be monotonic with respect to extensions of the computational system. Um, and that actually relates to this question, which is maybe the same question, but from a, a more high level perspective, right? Uh, because uh, now we, we, that we've seen the effect, uh, well, the effect that effects have on realizability models, um, could we develop this effect agnostic notion of realizability uh, by exploring what truth can be made robust with respect to some underlying effects and, and which cannot? And uh, of course, uh, uh, perhaps the most uh, wide question is uh, what sort of realizability model we should uh, consider um, and, and maybe that's a question uh, to ask you if, if we're, we should consider something uh, of interest to the homotopy type theory uh, community. Um, yes, so that's all I had to say and thank you for your attention. Great, thanks very much, Lyra. So we'll all do our usual silent applause now. It was a great talk and uh, now I'll open the floor to questions. If you have a question, um, the easiest is if you just unmute your mic and ask, but you can also type in the chat if you would like. I can ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so thank you, it was very interesting. Um, so I mean, so I've, I'm also aware of, uh, so I was especially interested in your notion of these evidenced frames. Um, so I'm aware of other people who have tried to develop general, uh, general frameworks for, for building realizability toposes. So I think there's work by Jonas Frey and Peter Hofstra, and I think also some people like Alexandre Miquel um, were motivated by things like Kevin's classical realizability. So I, I'm not, I mean, so there's a whole zoo of abstract approaches to, to, to general realizability. So do you have any idea of how your, your evidence frames fits into this, uh, into this world? Um, uh, I, I do it to some extent. Um, so um, yes, so uh, Mikel's notion of, um, in, in particular, I'll answer, uh, about that, um, Mikhail's notion of uh, implicative algebras, right, is mm -hmm. also an abstract framework for uh, constructing realizability models more inclined to the classical realizability, but, but also for intuitionistic realizability. Um, but um, so, okay, I'll start with what I can say. Uh, so what I can say is that uh, an implicative algebra um, basically induces an evidence frame and an evidence frame induces an implicative algebra, which is something very interesting that we discovered. Uh, uh, we kind of uh, did not know of that uh, or did not consider it. And then um, uh, Miki uh, and I uh, were talking uh, after uh, the fact and we kind of explored it and figured out that uh, um, they both induce one another. Uh, so they're very much related. And, and in fact, um, if, if you take the corresponding implicative algebra and evidence frame, uh, 
uh, they basically construct the same tripos. Okay, so, so they're very much connected, but um, right, there are a lot of differences too. So uh, because they were developed kind of more inclined to the realizability, uh, to the classical realizability, uh, there is no separation there between realizers and propositions, right, in implicative algebras. And, and also um, they use, uh, they basically use power sets, right? So the construction is somewhat more complex and it's not as clear, the proofs as programs is not as clear as in the evidence frame. So it's less convenient if you want to look at computations, but it's much more convenient if you want to just consider the algebra, right? So it's a, it's a more abstract if you want to look in the algebra, but you can't really invoke specific notions of computations in, into that system in a, in a natural way, let's say. Um, so I can, I can speak to that very, just because it's a kind of a very concrete conversation that we had just recently. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I'll ask a quick question. Hi, Laurent. Hi. So in, in the evidence frame, I noticed that the notion of quantification, it seems to be kind of what we call a uniform for all. It's not a dependent for all. And that's very interesting because, yeah, we have this kind of, in Nupro we have intersection types and we have this kind of conjecture that we don't really need to have the, uh, the function type as a primitive, we could actually construct it from the uniform version. So anyway, that's, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Um, we, so, so uh, well, the quantification, the way we did it was uh, also in, uh, apart uh, from the fact that we took our uh, index set to be inhabited, right? So that helped us with forming this intersection there. And uh, it has a lot to do, um, with some details about the impredicativity, um, uh, the, the reason why we chose it uh, to be this way. Um, because um, when, when I talked about, for example, that um, we have one realizer that works for all of them without actually uh, looking into the eyes, the specific eyes, so that means that in our, um, you know, in a, a, we, we can actually, um, it, it's essential when we want to model in predicativity, right? Because it means that the index set uh, does not itself need to have any computational representation, right? So it was uh, critical for the in predicativity to, to do the universal quantification this way. Um, because we wanted to be able to talk about the set of all propositions, right? Um, so uh, that's why we chose it. Uh, we, we didn't start off this way, but that's just how it worked. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's interesting that this notion of uniform for all is, you know, comes up in various places, like, you know, Bob and I proved right. the completeness, the completeness. Theorem, you know, for, for uniform validity, it's, you know, anyway, so anyway, it's just interesting, so. I think we have time for one more quick question. Okay, well, if there aren't any more questions, let's all silently thank Liron again. Thank you. Okay, and then we will reconvene for the next talk in six minutes. <laughs>